My name is Wendy Carrillo. I am the assembly member that represents the 51st Assembly District. So all of Echo Park, Northeast LA, and East LA, and your community of Highland Park, Baratunde. Day. That's right. HLP represent. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So this Such is a great, awesome community. This is technically a constituent call. Uh, <laughs> it is. Yeah. I care very deeply about my constituents. Do this all the time. How how long have you <laughs> how long have you been in this position, Assembly Member Carillo? Uh, well, I uh, was elected on a special election, so I came into office uh, January 2018. So I am starting my third year. And and how has your role? changed with the coronavirus slash COVID-19? What's, uh, what's different? Well, I think one of the, well, one, I have never experienced anything like this in my lifetime, just like you and, and many other people within the city of LA and certainly across the state of California and uh, really the world. I mean, the last pandemic that we had was 100 years ago. And I think the, the main difference is that we uh, are not in Sacramento. We're not in what's called session. We're not doing our, our traditional process and writing bills and getting them introduced in committee hearings. And uh, instead, we passed uh, you know, a bill that allows the governor to really take ownership and have executive power to, to run the state as needed. And we're trying to just you know, be as helpful as we possibly can here in our own community yeah. as we um, figure out a time in which we're going to go back to Sacramento, which at this point is May 4th. So, so here in, in our community, we're probably blocks apart. Who knows? I have no idea where anyone is. Anymore. <laughs> we are. What are absolutely. you, um, what are some of the things that stand out to you in your district as far as how the impact of this pandemic is being felt? So, you know, um, I ran for office because this is the community that I grew up in, that I live in, and that I'm now uh, so privileged to represent. And so what I can tell you is within the 51st Assembly, like within Highland Park, uh, within Eagle Rock, within Echo Park, within parts of Silver Lake that are in the district versus uh, East Los Angeles, communities are incredibly different and have different needs um, and different resources altogether. What's important to me is to have a, a really good relationship with our mayor, which is our, obviously the city of Los Angeles, and with our county supervisor, Hilda Solis, uh, that represent different portions of the district on different government tiers. And so, but I... <laughs> yes, my that's a that's metaphor. That's Everything right. is topsy-turvy <laughs> right now. But you've recovered well. You nailed it. That's a resilient <laughs> rep, y'all. Check it out. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, I try, I try. Um, so what I think is really great about our community is that St. Vincent's Hospital, uh, it's a hospital that shut down uh, some years ago, a year or so ago, um, uh, in the West Lake Pico Union area. And that hospital is one of the hospitals that the governor has uh, put some money into to reopen, to work with our community health partners to ensure that we are, that hospital becomes uh, available again and just became available again with 244 beds for COVID patients. Uh, we have several uh, recreational centers across the district in Echo Park and in Eagle Rock that are serving as uh, temporary homeless shelters. There's food drives all over the district. And I think that's the biggest number one issue mm. is that um, an LA Times report just came out earlier this week that said only 45% of all Angelinos have been able to retain their jobs. The additional percentage has lost their job. They don't know where income's coming in, how they're going to pay their mortgage, how they're going to pay their rent, how they're going to put food on the table. And so these are all real things that people are facing every day. And we are trying to be as helpful as possible in getting those resources out to the community. So I uh, personally, out of my campaign funds, have uh, contributed $10,000 to the LAUSD uh, Grab and Go Meals, which at this point have served uh, 7 million. Can you imagine 7 million Whoa. meals to kids and families, um, and an additional ten thousand to the um, the community arm or the nonprofit arm of the uh, Los Angeles Federation of Labor to make sure that they're doing these massive food runs with um, food drives with the um, LA Food Bank to yeah. feed families. And you know, we before this all happened, we were already living in a time in which children go to sleep hungry. So you can imagine that extreme now. 
across the city. Do you feel that the response is uh, adequate to the size of the challenge so far? I think everyone's trying to work as, as hard as we possibly can to have an adequate response. But if you, if you were to take a look at the state of California and the state of New York, which I know you were a resident of at some Until point. Until last year. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you came here. That's right. To LA, uh, to the, the West Coast, the best coast. <laughs> but, um, you know, Governor Cuomo out of New York uh, is managing a crisis that impacted the city of New York and the state of New York in a completely different way. Having seen that, uh, Governor Newsom has reacted in ways that have protected the 40 million lives in the state of California. And so, and in doing so has given local mayors or local municipalities and counties the authority to enact policies that are needed on the ground. And I think that's made a difference and has helped save thousands of lives. Who are you, uh, focusing again on your district, who are you most worried about? Who are you seeing mm -hmm. having the hardest time to get through this? Gosh, there's such a diverse group of people in our district. Um, so we are, in, in your industry, for example, uh, the entertainment and writers, independent contractors, um, folks that that need help, that don't have any income coming in any other way. And because of that, the government or the federal government has created a pandemic relief specifically for self-employed independent contractors. Um, that's never been done before. Yeah. So that's, that's one aspect uh, of the spectrum. The other aspect of the spectrum is our undocumented workforce. And so the most marginalized of all marginalized communities that have no resources at all. And the state of California under Governor Newsom has created the only national fund to help undocumented workers. In my opinion, it is a complete moral thing to do. It is the right thing to do, but it is not enough. And we need to do more. I think above anything else, uh, this pandemic has really highlighted the social and economic injustice and inequities across the country and specifically here at home. Yeah. Um, how do you, how has the, how has what, I, the people are always asking their politicians for things. They want you to vote a certain way. <laughs> they want you to pass a, a license for their business. Maybe like they want a favor, right. you know? <laughs> and, and so of your constituent requests shifted over the past, you know, month or two. I think the biggest thing that we have seen is um, a, a total and necessary conversation around rent forgiveness and the importance of paying your rent versus being able to buy food. Mm. And, and in my community, and in, you see this in Highland Park a lot, and the way that our community is built, there's a lot of mom and pop two residential properties, right? So it's like a front house and a back house. Yeah. You rent the back house and it helps pay for the mortgage. The conversation that needs to happen on a federal level is a mortgage forgiveness program so that small mom and pop owners can actually work out the deals with their tenants and their rents to be able to not have their, for their home foreclosed on. It was just a few years ago that we went through the foreclosure crisis across the country we can't afford our communities can't afford uh to go through that process again and there is no um there hasn't been a, a real actual conversation around that and i think that's important and we need to push our congressional leaders to actually lead on that effort not only for residential but for commercial property yeah i bet that there is a restaurant down the block from where you live that you love to go to a local coffee shop right that has to shut down during this pandemic, mm -hmm. that can't afford to pay their commercial rent, that uh, property owner perhaps can't afford to pay their commercial property, that coffee shop owner is probably also a resident who can't afford to pay their rent or pay their mortgage. Like These are real legitimate things that the city doesn't have total jurisdiction on, the county doesn't have jurisdiction over, and neither does the state. The federal government needs to figure this out. And not just for the big corporations, but for everyday Americans that need help. So in my case, it's El Huarache Azteca. Uh, hey, I, love that place. I love that place. Have you, 
I, there's a plaque that I signed on the wall. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> It's a little it's a little disheartening to hear those words. It's up to the federal government uh, because nowadays that seems to be the arm of government or the layer of government that is sort of least responsive, least prepared. I've been very excited about mayors and governors and specifically my mayor and my governor, a little less uh-huh. so uh, what's happening out of the White House. Is, is there a way or an ask that you would have of people watching this, especially people in your area, to help light a fire, you know, under that uh-huh. federal government or in any other way uh, provide more support to the community where you're seeing that need? Well, um, there's there's certainly the best way is to advocate directly with your member of Congress and with our U.S. senators. So Senator Kamala Harris has actually introduced um, some ideas around legislation for credit card forgiveness, mm. right? The credit card moratorium. So again, credit cards, interest rising up what about if you have lost all your income and you have automatic payments and now you're having to pay overdrawn fees out of your bank there's that Um, and really if you are a a homeowner uh, advocating for a mortgage relief program which uh, congresswoman maxine waters has proposed as well um, our congressman in the 34th congressional um, uh, who represents highland park in these communities jimmy gomez has done the same and so, one, it's an issue of getting a hold of their offices and saying, I support this. I need you to help us move this. Yeah. What do you need from us? How many, how many calls can we get? And who do we need to pressure and build additional support towards? Um, because these are not, there's no easy answer, but there are answers that need to come from the federal government because the city, the county, and the state can only do so much. Yeah. Um, how, are, how are you bearing the pressures, the unique pressures, of this time as a, as a citizen, as a resident, and a, as a representative? There are different pressures, Bertunde. For example, like um, I'm the eldest of five daughters. Uh, three of my sisters have lost their jobs. So they, the financial loss of income is, is very real. My parents are 61, and they are both essential workers. And we worry about them every day, them leaving the house, having to go to work, coming back home, and we try to be as helpful as possible. And there are countless families that have essential workers at every different level, whether it's frontline at a hospital or essential at a supermarket. Um, This is a very real conversation about how we value human dignity and human life. Um, And I think that's a a large, a large part of the, of the conversation that we, that we need to have. And how do we shift following this? There was a photo that I saw on Facebook that was so incredibly telling. Somebody took a photo of a homeless individual um, just like laid out on the street outside of a restaurant with a patio where the people were just eating and having a good time. And here's this human being like just passed out uh, who clearly needed help um, right outside of it. And the the caption said, we were broken before COVID-19. And that, like, look, I'm getting chills just thinking about it because that, I think, is is at the end, like, really, how do we change? How do we shift the economic perspective to include everybody and to really have justice for all people? Do you have any ideas? I do have some ideas. <laughs> Actually, I think there are some ideas that we could do here in the state of California. One of them is, is addressing the issue of homelessness and mental health. Uh, the issue of jobs. Look, I'm wearing a shirt that says. <laughs> yes. You still there? Okay. You're you're so <laughs> fast on the recovery. Um, so you get points know, for tried. for your own speed. Go ahead. So tell Thank me about the shirt. Yes. Uh, so this shirt, school not prisons, right? We all believe in a in um, a cr- criminal justice reform and ensuring that we uh, shift the conversation around that. But as we have, as we work towards ensuring that people are back home in their community there has to be a safety net that we talk about education and jobs because otherwise what we're doing is just creating um, additional folks that could potentially be homeless if you come back home Mm. to communities like highland park that have changed dramatically in the last few years and your family is no longer here where do you go if you're coming back to east l.a you're coming back to echo park you're coming back to communities that no longer look the same perhaps when you went in and there are no jobs and there are there's no place that you can afford to live because rent is above two thousand dollars and you have no skills 
then how is the society helping me? So there has to be a deep conversation about investment in that. We still spend uh, more on incarceration than we do on education. And this generation of students, imagine you being a second grader right now and you're learning how to read and all of a sudden you can't in your home and you don't have the resources anymore. How is that second grader ever going to catch up? The statistic is that if you cannot read by third grade reading level by that age, we will lose you into a system. That's like a harsh reality. How do we create this pandemic has also uh, allowed for us to see that we have a shortage of doctors, we have a shortage of nurses, we have a shortage of practically everything, and the and the population doesn't measure to that. So how do we shift that? How do we invest in the things that matter? Um, and I think that's a conversation that the state certainly can have, but would require, I think, a deeper investment uh, across the country. Yeah. Well, if only we had like a national election coming up in the near future. <laughs> Yeah, if only if only, you know, vote by mail wasn't seen as such a threat, right? right? If actually everybody could have the opportunity to vote and not have to risk their lives to go stand in line as we saw recently in Wisconsin to be able to to vote and, and cast a, a very patriotic American thing and value which is your right to be able to vote. Yeah. Is there is there anything else you want to um to address, talk about, ask of people, share with people? <laughs> Open ended. I I would say that um, that if you are practicing being safe at home, that's amazing. Like flatten the curve, and I think it's okay to be in your feelings about wishing to be outside. It's okay to feel like maybe you're getting a little bit of cabin fever. It's human. It's normal. It's totally okay. But I would also say to perhaps find a moment to shift your narrative. And think about and your and your frame of thought and think about all the people that are working outside and risking their health every day so that you can have delivery at home, so that you can practice being at home. We have farm workers in the state of California in the Central Valley that are risking their lives every day without PPE. And without them, there's no way that we can have the food in the grocery stores. There's no way that you can be enjoying, you know, baking that tenth loaf of bread that you're that you're doing because everybody's baking now. Um, and just, just to shift and be grateful and be thankful that you don't have to be out there and to have gratitude towards those, those workers that are, that are still working every day. Uh, that would be, I think the biggest, the biggest thing that I would ask and, and to be thankful to all of our, our, uh, frontline first responders who are out there every day. That's beautiful advice. Um, I want to express my gratitude to you, uh, as my member of the assembly, you posted some really great resources and I've been sharing that around and just learning more about this community. I'm so new to myself and what an odd time to get acquainted with a neighborhood <laughs> from inside yeah. my home and through FaceTime and Zoom. Uh, but I think you're doing a really good job and I thank you for making yourself available formally as a rep, but also just informally as a human. It's really, it's really great to uh, catch up with you and people are going to appreciate a lot of what you have to share. Thank you. You're doing awesome. Thank you. Yes, you so maybe are I've CNN. Had six, maybe I've had six cups of coffee, basically. <laughs> <laughs> big mug. So, so this is this is um this is more local question for you, but I think I'm starting to see this split response, and I think partly it's a linguistic thing where I see the English speaking Highland Park because that's the world I live in, and I know a little bit of Spanish, but I'm not so tight with like my Spanish speaking neighbors in those businesses to even know what's happening. And I also see this technological, tech-enabled response, and I wonder if the mom and pops are able to take advantage of that. So there's like mad businesses who jumped on Caviar and DoorDash to take advantage of delivering their cocktails. You can see like the new hip spots on Figueroa, like making mm -hmm. a go of it. And then I wonder, like, is the, what happens to the cart that's selling you know, the local foods, what's happening to Warache Azteca versus like the new hip biker coffee shop that's on Square Cash. What are you seeing in terms of the, the disparate response from the truly longer term local, more Highland Park type business to be able to withstand yeah. this economic shop, shock and adapt to the ways of survival that the new kids on the block are being able to take advantage of? 
Oh my gosh, Bertina, that's such a important question about the livelihood of our community and what, what makes a community a neighborhood. It's the local mom and pop that, you know, knows you're special uh, whenever you come in. They know what you're going to order. They know you by name. That's not necessarily, you know, tech savvy, but is just an integral part of the community. Uh, these sometimes these these businesses um, are known as uh, I have it right here micro enterprises. Okay. And I had a really great conversation with the president and CEO of the uh, Los Angeles area chamber of commerce. Her name is Maria Salinas. In terms of how do we help these communities, especially those that are underbanked, meaning that maybe you know they get cash, it's cash revenue, whether mm-hmm. it's your local taco stand, right? They know you know that they're there outside of that of the bar, like every Thursday, Friday at X amount of time, right? The cash business. So where do they go, and how do they get help? Uh, or maybe it's a small business that doesn't earn more than two hundred thousand dollars a year, but two hundred thousand is a still a, a good amount of money for a family in a, in a small business. And so how do you keep them afloat and supportive? So I think the, the answer to your question is, yes, support the ones that are online and the ones that make it easy for you to receive what you need. But also as being as careful as you possibly can when you go outside, try to venture out and support some of the other businesses, the local panaderia, the local coffee shop, the local mom and pop shop that you know perhaps isn't as technologically savvy as um, and being so on being some of the apps. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, uh, it's been yeah. on my mind and I'm like, how do we, what can we do? How do you enter? How do, I'm, I'm, I don't know, but I, I feel the diff, the distance yeah. and the difference. Yeah. Sometimes it's even as easy as, as um, offering to help. Yeah. Right. Like, is there a member of their family? Is there a member of that particular place that you frequent often that, would be open and willing to learn how to use some of the technology available to, to stay afloat. Yeah. Uh, and maybe they just need a little entry point. Uh, I'll just share like a few years ago, um, square, mm-hmm. you know, the little, the little, um, little card thing reader you, for like, your smartphone little card yeah. reader, yeah. uh, started, uh, their Spanish version of the app. And it was a trip to me to go to the Elote man on, on Figueroa and like 56. And he had the little square. And I thought, oh, I can't buy an elote because I don't have any cash. And then he's like, no, I have a square. Like, that's amazing. Yes. Okay, I'm buying three. But it's, it's that um, we are at a point, I think, in, in our generation where we're seeing that connection, that flip, yeah. right? Um, and actually, like, the digital divide is very real. And that's the conversation that is also being had in education. Because if there is no school, right? and kids are learning at home and your parents can't afford $40 a month to have internet or Wi-Fi at home, something that we take for granted, mm-hmm. right? Then how do we provide it at a cost that is um, more reasonable to families? Or how does the city uh, take ownership of that? And just these are things now, just like water in the air we breathe, technology, Wi-Fi, and being connected should yeah. be seen at that same at that same level. 